Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show today. Oof, it is a little toasty in here, so don't mind me. So I want to go ahead and welcome you guys to the weekly show called Grow Wealthy Grooming. I am your host, River Lee. I am a certified feline master groomer. I currently own and operate a feline exclusive mobile grooming business. Before that, I owned a grooming salon with five employees. I've been in the pet industry for over 10 years as a dog trainer, doggy daycare manager. Uh, I've been a pet sitter. I've worked corporate. If you want to learn more about me, feel free to go to my website, SavvyGroomer.com. And if you guys are here, you're watching the replay, feel free to uh, continue to join me on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern time for this show, which is Grow Wealthy Grooming. Uh, you know, please subscribe so you never miss a video. And if you're a pet groomer, please feel free to apply to my Facebook group, Finances for the Grooming Industry, where we continue to low and where we continue to grow and learn. All right. So this is kind of an odd video. Um, I know it's I'm sorry, I'm trying to fix my hair. I know that we generally talk about things about wealth, but I want to talk today about, it's kind of an odd subject. So I know a couple of people were talking about, they have a grooming salon and they have fantastic employees, but for some reason, the groom, the owners won't let them groom the dog. So in other words, what's happening in a couple of people's salons that, I mean, I've seen this reoccurring. I've seen people post it over and over again. They have run a salon and now they are, you know, they're running a salon. They've built the salon up. They're too busy. They hire a groomer and they want to know why owners are not allowing these other groomers to groom their dogs. And I want you to think about first, when you walk into a store and, you know, let's say it's a service-based store. So, um, perfect example, let's use hair salons. If I walk into a hair salon, I go to a hair salon. And I have a very specific woman that I trust with my hair. She does my coloring. Uh, I know today is not a great example, but you know she does my color. She does my cut. I know I can trust her. I know the skill set she has. I know what she produces, and I really feel comfortable with her. I know she's not going to steer me wrong. Now, if I had made an appointment with the woman that does my hair, and they said, "Oh, Amanda's busy today. However, we have Sally." There are some people that are going to be like, oh, okay, well, obviously, Amanda wouldn't put me in a position that Sally would be just as comparable. But I'd almost want to be sold on Sally's skills. Is she have all the certifications that my hairdresser does? You know, is she, how long has she been a hairdresser? Um, how long has she been employed there? Where did she work before? You know, as a customer, I had started my relationship with the salon, not with the salon, but with my hairdresser. And we run into a lot of the same issues. Um, if you guys get massages regularly, I have uh, two or three people that I see pretty regularly. Um, one is my favorite person. They're very, very busy. Hence, I have a second favorite person. And then if I really needed everything in a pinch, I know somebody who is a third acceptable person. Now, I would always rather have the first person but the second person will do, and the third person will do in a pinch. And that sounds kind of crazy when you think about it, because I'm going to the same business. And they all have very similar qualifications, but they have different modalities. They have different skill sets. They have different things that they're better at. The first person I go to is actually a gentleman, and he can do deep tissue. Um, he's very good at being intuitive. Like if I wince a little bit, he knows how to like work my muscles. And that's not just because he's good at his job. It's also because he knows me. He sees me on a regular basis. So when you think about things like that, you're going, okay. But when this person comes with their dog, I want them to trust anyone who's hired. So let's let's have like a come to Jesus here. You know, let's have a real honest conversation. How many of you people, grooming salon owners and employees alike, bitch and moan about all your employees? You're always telling me how much your employees are giving you attitude, how they're not listening, they're not keeping up with quality, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. You don't believe in your employees. So then why should a customer? And let me give you kind of we're going to talk a little bit about why your customer 
it's not unreasonable for them to not want this random person that you've hired, but also what you can do about it. So this may be a little bit longer of a video. I'm hoping I can get through this pretty quickly. So let's start with, if you're a customer walking in, how, do you have time to communicate with them about this new person that's going to be grooming their pet? I'm going to take a wild guess and assume that you're not grooming at a chop shop. If you guys are watching these videos, you care about your industry, you care about your job, you care about your salon, you care about the growth of this industry as well as yourself. You are not going to be that person who is going to have the customer ideally that treats their pet like crap. You're probably charging a reasonable amount of money. That person cares about their pet. Therefore, they care about who is grooming that pet. So do you as the owner, if you are, you know, let's say if I come in, I have a wonderful kitty named Fire. I have a dog, but I feel like cats, it's a little bit different. Okay, okay, we'll use my dog because some of you guys are not familiar with cat grooming and I don't want to go into that. So I have a standard poodle. She's in a modified German cut and I do take her to another groomer because I'm lazy. Let's be real. So if I bring Rory, that's her name, in and let's say I say, oh, Tiffany, Tiffany's normally the one who grooms my dog. And Tiffany says, oh, Sarah's going to be grooming your dog today. And if Tiffany's there saying, you know, I'm really overbooked today, that's a terrible excuse. Let's say she said that. I'm terribly overbooked today, but Sarah's wonderful. She has all these certifications. She's a competition level groomer. She's amazing. Da, 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 da. I will be here to supervise everything and maintain quality. And I just want to let you know that's what's going to happen. Am I happy? Probably not. But do I accept it? Yes. Um, that's the truth. I'm probably going to accept it. Now, if Sarah comes up and just like takes my dog in the back, I'm going to assume Tiffany's going to do the dog. And I'd be like, this is kind of weird. Um, or the dreaded come back and my dog is on the table with another groomer. And then I'm like, hi, who are you? Why are you touching my dog? What's going on? That's not great. So as the owner, if you are going to hire employees and you have especially an open air shop or you have a situation where you are going to have a groomer groom someone's dog that they've never groomed before, it's important for you to have that communication with that client. Now, I know I've talked about this a few times and I know a lot of people don't like to hear this, but this is why it's really important for the groomer owner to ideally be able to manage their salon versus just being a groomer. Because if you have, let's say, five to eight dogs a day, I know some of you guys can do 10 to 12. I'm realistically a five to seven dog cat person. I really can't do more than that with feeling comfortable. You need time to communicate with customers. If you have to groom five to seven, eight dogs a day, you don't have 15 minutes to communicate with a client that you're that's not a dog you're grooming. It's a lot of time. You know, especially if they have questions, concerns, things you have to go over with them, they may not be happy. They may not want that. And ideally it would be something you would talk to before they got there, but a lot of times you don't have time. So that's one thing. So ideally you would be managing your salon, but let's say you're not. And this is why you hired your first employee. You know, it is tough. You know, in a perfect world, we would all have lots of money. And when that new client comes in, you're going to be able to communicate with them in a way that makes sense. You're going to say, oh, you know, hi, Mrs. Jones. You know, I know I normally groom Rory. However, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're taking Sarah's going to be grooming Rory today. Da, 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 da. But for the most part, you guys just assume this customer will be perfectly OK with that, which is crazy to me. I wouldn't be. And I'm a groomer, maybe because I know what can go wrong or what can happen. And also the way we all groom, and I've talked about this in other videos, we all groom slightly different. So, you know, my dog gets a modified German. Again, like, do I have to explain what this dog is going to need? Or is the owner going to have time to explain it? So if I bring Rory in, I want, you know, her ears, her face and her feet 40. She's a standard poodle. Um, I want all the hair gone from the inside of her ears, mainly because she, you know, likes to go in the water and she gets chronic ear infections if she doesn't have that hair plucked. I know it's controversy, but that's what happens with my dog, you know, and I like, I like a wide sanitary because she's gross. You know, that's the truth. And these are things that I don't have to communicate with someone who grooms my pet all the time. Some new person, are there notes in the computer? Do I have to tell them? Or am I going to get the dog back the same way? And as a customer, these are questions I have. 
And if the owner or the normal groomer is there to communicate them, it's a lot easier. So those are a couple of things. You know, another thing is too, when we build our businesses, one of the biggest problems, the biggest kerfuffles that groomers do when you're starting to build your business is when you start selling yourself, when people walk in the door and you are here to sell your business, like not to customers, you know what I mean? So why people come to you? If I were to ask you, why do people come to your salon? The most common answers are, I offer quality grooms. They tell me all about their certifications. They tell me all about um, how they handle pets and they treat them like family. Those are great. But when you hire someone, you hope, like, yes, there are certifications for dog grooming and cat grooming. I would say easily the majority of pet groomers are not certified. Easily. I mean, there are, what, 300 certified feline master groomers in the entire world. Everyone touching a cat's not certified. Great. You know, and not all training comes equal. I was certified at a uh, college in Massachusetts for pet grooming. I got a leg a day. When I was learning to dog groom, I would get a leg a day because there would be four people on one dog. That is not the same education, let's say, if you go to Paragon uh, for dog grooming. It's not the same. It's not. And I ended up working for six months under a certified master groomer learning how to actually groom properly. And I did that for free. I worked for a groomer for six months for free to get properly educated, which I probably could have saved getting certified at that college. But so everyone learns so differently and everyone's going to take that education differently. Like I went on to do a mentorship and not everyone does. So someone with my education, they could say, oh, I've seen them. They, they went to this college. They have this skill level. Okay, I'm going to hire someone from the same place. I think I have a totally different skill set. So when you hire somebody, you don't, you hope, most of us, when we hire someone, and, and it's a terrible thing in the grooming industry, we just kind of like throw them at them. Like they come in for one work day where they're practicing. We watch them bathe. We watch them groom, maybe two dogs, maybe two dogs, some people, three dogs, but most of the time it's one dog. It's mostly our dogs because we don't want them to goof up one of our customers' dogs. So we give them a dog that's generally well-behaved that, you know, gets groomed regularly. And we're like, okay, that's satisfactory. And then we hire this person. And then we're grooming a full day's worth of dogs. And then we just give these people our customers. That's insane. Does anyone ever sit there and go, what are we doing in this industry? What's so fascinating is that, you know, whenever I go to uh, business conferences that are outside the grooming industry, and I explain this, they just look at me like I'm nuts. They're like, well, you mean there's no, because like, here's the thing. They're like, oh, well, they, they're they licensed. I'm like, well, there's no licensing. Oh, well, they're certified. Well, most of us aren't certified. Most of our theory is self-taught or we've been trained, but we've been trained to varying degrees and different specialties. You know, let's be truthful. You know, and they're like, okay. So then how does the owner maintain quality? And that's where we all get kind of screwed. Because we hire someone in a, in a lot of these companies that are outside the pet industry, they would have someone, so they would they would start them incrementally. And this is what I did in my business. I had to learn the hard way. But so they would hire someone and they would have a system in place with employee handbooks and all these things. I don't want to go too far down this road, but they would have systems in place because then they have to get better and the tier. So, okay, I'm going to view bathe and blow dry every dog, nails, ears, all that. And then the owner would double check quality or the manager would double check quality and all of them are acceptable. Perfect. And they've been doing that for a week. Perfect. Okay. And now you're going to do rough cuts and you're going to do this and you check every dog and it's quality. It's perfect. And then you groom all these dogs and it's quality. It's perfect. Most of us don't even double check our employees work every day. And I know there are some groomers you don't have to check. Although personally, I think everyone should ch check over everyone's dogs and cats if you don't work alone, because a second eye is amazing. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've missed something really simple and it's nothing bad. It's nothing that the customer would notice, but it makes a better groom, you know, or 
they might sit there and say, oh, you know, I like how you did this, but if you had just done this, this would have been a little bit better. And that's what's really nice. Um, let me just read this comment really quick. Do you think that this inconsistency of training and the lack of true certifications are the results-based environment of grooming? Um, I think it really depends. You know, I'm going to infer some things. Do I think that if we had uh, certainly CAC grooming has a very different certification. CAC grooming, you hit these points and then you're a CFMG. And so people that are CFMGs, it's pretty straightforward, but there's also not the breed differences, the coat types. There are a lot less options in CAC grooming than there are dog grooming. But with dog grooming, I, you know, even, even if they went to the same school, even if they have the same, like a lot of certified master groomers in the dog industry, you know, you know, breed standards change, you know, someone who does poodles, there's a wide range. Like someone I knew does competition level poodles and she's amazing. She breeds and shows poodles, but she still goes to somebody who has more training in poodles to get better at poodles. And that's just one breed. That's just one breed. So there, there's just wild, wide ranges of that. And that's really difficult. It's very difficult to learn everything in this industry. So when you hire somebody, knowing your specialty and their specialty helps. But nine times out of 10, we don't know. And you hope this groomer can do these things. Sometimes they'll send you a picture of a dog. We don't actually know they did that dog. We don't actually know that, you know, they're still good at that dog. Um, you know, I've been grooming cats for a <sighs> what now, three years? And if you handed me a cocker, I couldn't do a proper cocker pattern. It's been so long. It really has. Like, I'd love to say, yes, I could do it. If I had like notes from the grooming table and if I had someone like, oh yeah, I remember this. So that's where, when I, and I know I want to get to why customers won't do it, but I want you to think about that. You know, you're hiring somebody, you're hoping they have the knowledge they claim to have, and then you're letting them loose on your customers. So that's why your customers are nervous about that because it's very difficult to know. Like that's why they came to you. They came to you because you told them they could trust you. And then you are handing them off to another person. And if they've been with you for several years, they may trust you enough to do that. But maybe they don't want to and you have to create incentive. So there's different ways to create incentive. You might say, okay, anybody who wants to be groomed by me, there's going to be an, a price increase. If you don't want the price increase, you can go with the employee. Um, another way to create loyalty to the business versus just you. So, you know, my business was the Green Paw Spa and I adored it. But in the beginning, it was me. People wanted me because they knew I loved their animal. I would treat them well. They knew my quality. They knew I would accept nothing less. And so when I would hire somebody, again, I did this a very traditional way where I would have five to seven dogs of my own, hire them, and within three days of them being here, handed them a full day of dogs. And then they'd be like, you know, he made the ears straight instead of triangular like you used to. And I'd be like, oh, it's an easy fix. But now they've got to come back for something so simple. So then I would put in notes. Um, things like, oh, you know, I would do a five on a dog. And it's like, okay, but is it a hard five or a light five? Like how hard do they press on a five? It would look different, you know, scissoring legs. I know we've talked about this in other videos. And if I was there, so what I ended up doing is I hired a receptionist because then when people walked in, in my shop, I chose not to have mine open. I don't personally like open shops. I think you're asking yourself personally, that's me. I think that you're asking for liabilities. I think that you're asking for people to put you all over social media. I think customers don't understand what's going on. Um, so I don't personally like open air shops. But if you choose to do that, you can't hide if you're doing the dog or if you're not doing the dog. If you do have a closed off shop like I did, we would have a receptionist. So if we lost a customer, I'm sorry, if we lost an employee, it wouldn't matter because no one would know they were there or not. And that's the tough part is when you, so again, common problem in the pet industry is high turnover rate. So when I say high turnover rate, it's you hire somebody, they're there for four months, six months, a year, two years, and then they move on. I personally believe a lot of that comes down to 
people being feeling like they're stuck in a rat wheel. Because if you're a groomer, there's always going to be five dogs, seven dogs every day. There, You don't ever catch up. You don't ever get ahead of anything. You know, you just kind of get stuck in this cycle. And if you want more money, the only way you can do that is to either move to a salon that charges more, um, go try to negotiate a better rate somewhere with another business owner, or open up your own shop. So a lot of groomers get really stuck like that. But going back to being in the shop, you know, I want you to think to yourself, okay, if you're the business owner, say, okay, so this groomer's been here a very short period of time, and now this stranger is coming over to this client's dog, touching this dog, asking questions that you would just know. Um, how many times, I'm guilty of this too, how many times have we had a customer that's been coming in every four weeks for the last two, three years, and you're like, same as usual, same as usual, and they just hand them the dog, versus this new groomer is like touching their dog and their dog doesn't know this person. And they're kind of like, oh, do you want like half inch on the body? And they're like, like, don't you know? It's like, it's almost like the customer is coming into a new grooming salon. And if the customer wanted to change grooming salons, they would have gone to a uh, grooming salon. Um, so Megan is saying, any advice on how to get clients to follow you from corporate grooming to a new salon without corporate coming after you? That's a great question, Megan. Um, it's a little off topic for this, but what I will tell you is that, Megan, one thing you have to know, so guys, there are three levels of grooming. There is business owner, there is self-employed groomers, so that is your independent contractors or booth renters, and then there are employees. So it's okay, Megan, don't worry about it. So here's the thing is that when you are an employee, the business itself owns the clients. So legally speaking, when you are an employee, the business, the clients are owned by the business. They're assets of the business. So when you take clients from corporate, what ends up happening is that you are technically stealing. Legally, in most states, that is theft. You cannot solicit clients from an old business. Now, if you are going to a different grooming salon, you know, and I'm trying to read, is that a new, I'm assuming you're not going to be opening up your own shop. I, it sounds like you're going to be going to a new salon. That's actually a good idea to do something like in the paper, um, an announcement, um, get a good picture of you and your grooming smock and say, you know, I know, I'm always trying these generic names, you know, Grooming Dales welcomes Megan, you know, to our staff uh, now accepting appointments. And you get this put in a Facebook ad and you target places that in your corporate. Um, what's nice about Facebook marketing is that you can actually target the towns that would serve that area. And again, you just do like a little video. Hi, guys, it's Megan. You know, I just want to let you know that I'm going to be at Groomingdale's at this address and this phone number. We would love to see you there. You know, blah, 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 blah. And you're not soliciting those clients. However, if you get those clients, that is the loophole. But however, if you call those clients, Megan, if you take down their numbers, if you take down their names, if you take down any grooming information from those clients and you call them, they can sue the crap out of you. They can not just sue you. They can also sue the new business if you're an employee. Because now it's kind of like if I hired an employee knowing my employee was going to steal things from my previous employer, then that's where their that employer could be sued. And I know it's really hard because we feel like we own these clients because they love us. Like I, I had clients for 10 years follow me all over the place. Like, um, now I live in New England, so all over the place is like, but they would drive an hour, hour and a half sometimes to come to me. So I know what that feels like. But I want you to remember something, Megan, that you can let them know you're going to be leaving. You can let them know that, um, you know, how you can kind of work that, but you can't tell them where you're going. But you can tell them where to find you, if that makes sense. Um, a great way is to have a blog um, for those of you guys that work for other companies. It's really great for you 
to have a blog and let your customers know because then wherever you go, they would have it. Um, doing little mini things, it also creates you as a, I don't want to say as a, uh, you know, a reference, but it's really nice. It's really nice to have. So Megan's also saying that's amazing advice because I don't really know if I want to switch employees or do my own thing, but I don't want to get into legal troubles and I'm in upstate New York. And New York's pretty vicious. New York, you know, I know everyone thinks NYC, but New York state is really vicious in their laws. Be very, very careful. Um, Megan, if you haven't already, please watch my video. It's called um, uh, What's Wrong With Just Being an Employee? There's really nothing. There's actually a lot of benefit to just being an employee. Um, doing your own thing, you're going to pay more in taxes. You're not going to have any retirement. Um, I tell most people that visit me on this channel and other places, I have a great online program that's open twice a year called Personal Finance Unleash. We walk you guys through creating a budget and starting to create wealth. Um, I have a roadmap to financial success. And with all of that, it's going to be really important for you to have a big ass stash of money when you go out on your own and to have a really good beginning of retirement. Um, because God forbid, like for me, I fractured my back. Like I got into a car accident. I fractured my back. I'm still dealing with the legalities of that. So I can't even go back to a place that I groom large dogs. That's not an option for me. So I have to be self-employed this time because there's no employer that would hire me to to group, uh, to lift less than 20 pounds. And I'm very grateful that I have been in a very smart financial position before that happened. But there's so many groomers that, you know, they get carpal tunnel in both hands. If you work for corporate, they will pay for that surgery. If you work for yourself, you don't. They won't. If you get bit really bad, corporate will pay for that. If you work elsewhere, they won't. So if you have all the things that I suggest in my roadmap to financial success, then you'll be okay if those terrible things happen when you're self-employed. If you don't have that money set aside and you work for yourself, there are so many groomers that end in financial ruin. And that is so sad. I can't tell you how many people literally in groups will tell me, you know, what do I do? I'm popping Percocets or Vicodins because they're in so much pain every day when they're grooming. And they're like, what do I do? And they're like, oh, I'm going to do CBD oil and I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do that. But if they had just had the proper insurance or money set aside, it's you can't do it forever. You can't be in pain every day at your job forever. It, it doesn't work. So, I, you know, I don't know how old you're, Megan. I don't know what your financial situation is. But that is my best advice. I do think that these are great options to do if you want to start switching. But for now, it's a really good idea to start here. And learning how to be happy, I know it's really weird, but um, everyone knows I'm granola crunchy. I'm a little granola crunchy. I'm a little hippy dippy. Um, learning how to be happy no matter what is so important. So learning how to deal with the stress and the pressure and the bullshit of corporate will really set you up really well when you actually start owning your own business. Because right now, if there's a terrible customer who's being super rude to you, you call your manager. Uh, yes, yeah, Cindy, uh, this customer just told me to go fuck myself. And then Cindy comes in and deals with that customer. However, when you own your own business and that customer is throwing a fit, swearing at you, and you just want them to pay you and leave, now you've got to figure out, do I call the cops? Do I hang out here and just take this verbal abuse or what? Now you can fire them, but you know what they're going to do is go on social media and bitch and moan about you and potentially lose hundreds of customers from you. Whereas if you work corporate, everyone hates Petco and Pates Mart anyway. They just hate them already. So what have you got to lose? So don't you know, learning how to be okay with that because it's 10 times harder to own your own business. Nobody says that, but it is, you know, you go in, you groom, you get done, you leave. When you own your own shop, you have to answer the phones. You've got to create marketing, you've got to create the website. You've got to do all this other shit. So take, take some money, take some time, really hone your skills. See if you can get your, if you work for a new shop, make sure you're getting, you know, some sort of 401k, some sort of retirement, some sort of health insurance. And if you're not, consider why you're leaving because there's going to be bullshit no matter where you work. 
There are always going to be asshole clients. There are always going to be terrible managers. There's always going to be terrible everything. But you don't have to be miserable because of it. You know, it's like when you have crappy weather outside. I live in New England. I don't know why. You know, today it was 80 degrees and I want, I pulled out all my winter stuff. It's not, you know, so try to learn to be happy, which sounds like a dick thing to say, but that's the truth. Uh, Megan is saying grooming big dogs is the struggle. They are where the money is, but I can get through like four small dogs versus a large breed and I can get it done. I kind of want to get on a five-year plan. So no rush. Um, I'm actually going to take that down really quick, Megan. That is a, a video I want to do. I've done a blog on that, but I'm going to do another video on doing big dogs versus little dogs because actually big dogs generally don't make you more money because you can do, and the amount of time and effort you do one big dog, you can really do two or three small dogs. So let's say you charge a doodle 75, but you charge a Shih Tzu 50. If you can finish two Shih Tzus in the same amount of time you can do one doodle, you've actually earned $25 more and you haven't killed your back. And that's the truth. So it's really actually better for that. But I am gonna, that's a video I do wanna do. So I'm actually gonna write that down. Don't mind me guys. Um, and with the five-year plan, um, again, uh, I really suggest Personal Finance and Alicia, which is my online course. It is only open twice a year. And um, we are creating a membership site where you guys will be able to join and hop in earlier that has less intense stuff. But Personal Finance Unleash walks you through all of these things. Personal Finance Unleash is meant to be done about once a year over and over again because we do. I mean, where we are right now takes time. Financially, we take time. Um, if I start paying off debt, it could take three years. And this is built for pet groomers to build not just personal wealth, but to get yourself in a financial place that you can start making decisions about your life. I'm going to write big dogs, more money. So I will, I promise Megan, I will make a video about that, um, whether that'll be added to the blog or maybe we do that. That would actually be a really fun video for next week. I think that would be a lot of fun. Actually, I like that idea. Um, and feel free, anybody, if you want to comment in, you can always comment in. You know, I love comments. They're, they make this time go by a lot faster and it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. But let's go back really quick to why your clients aren't allowing your employees to groom. And again, it's, you know, Megan brings up a perfect example where she's talking about, you know, she's going to leave corporate and go to another salon. And we're not calling you out. I think you're not doing anything wrong. I think that's what we all do, right? We all move shops and that's what we do. So with that, you know, your client is attached to you not your, not your other groomer. And if your other groomer leaves, then they have to get another groomer and being the owner, they know you're always going to be here. Mm -hmm. They know you're always going to be here. So of course it makes sense that they're going to want to stay attached to you and they're going to want to build that relationship with you. And again, we all know how often groomers change jobs. So if they get attached to this groomer, this groomer is here for two years and now they're going to go with that other groomer, you know, and they don't know if that other groomer is going to go to Petco. They don't know if that other groomer is going to go to another shop and maybe that other shop doesn't fit their standard or maybe they're going to go to, um, you know, a mobile situation. They don't know. And it gets really difficult for a client. So when you're building now, how do I fix that? So in my shop, and again, everybody does everything so differently. Let me just tell you what I did. And if you guys have a better way, I would love to hear, or even a different way, in the comments below, please feel free to comment. So with me, what I did is I had a closed shop. I didn't like, I had, for a little bit, I had an open shop. And what I found is it caused way more problems than it solved. I found that dogs saw their owners a lot faster. Um, if I had uh, like a dog, like my standard poodle, like screams bloody murder when she gets her ears plucked, like bloody murder, like she's dying. Um, or a dog that's really wiggly for shaving its feet. If you have a standard poodle who just literally like, bull -bull. or how many Yorkies that we had that like, like sit there and like, bull -bull -bull -bull. like even, or you're like, you know, you got the groomer's helper on, they're just like, bah, 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 bah. 
you know, whatever, or you quick a nail and it, cause some dogs just bleed. Like you quick a nail just a little bit and there's like blood everywhere. So again, this is why I don't like open jobs because something very normal, very simple, a client might be like, what is that? Um, also, uh, if you have a client that's going to hang out, it's easier for them to hang out in an open air shop. Um, so anyway, so I didn't have an open air shop. That was my long tangent about that. But so I had a receptionist and in the beginning, that receptionist was me. So I would answer the phones. I would be the point of contact. And then I would have either in on busier days, I would have a bather who I trusted, who I knew was very solid in their skills and a groomer and everyone touched every dog. And some people were like, I don't like conveyor belt things. Well, it's not a conveyor belt. It was that the dog got used to everyone in the shop. The dog learned to trust anyone in that shop. It wasn't about trusting a person. It was all about trusting the people in the grooming salon. And it worked incredibly well because then we got, we had, we got, it was a very small salon. It was about 500 square feet, uh, five, 600 square feet. And we could do 40 dogs on a Saturday, bath, blow dries, haircuts, et cetera. I had five employees in a very small period of place because everyone knew what they had to do. Everyone knew the system. It worked really well. So we would have a dog come in and we had dogs come in every 15 minutes, believe it or not. Our, our appointment times were every 15 minutes and we had our schedule. Haircuts would come on the hours, bath on the half, and 15 minutes were our monthly program. And so that's how we had everybody. It was like we knew when somebody was coming in. It also gave the bather time because we had one tub enough time to figure out when they were going to come in. So the bait, you know, we had the someone prepping the nails, the ears, and then into the tub. And then on a really busy day, we'd have someone specifically there to blow dry, you know, and then the groomer. And so the dog got used to being there and having everyone touch them. And this is a very different business model than now where I'm mobile and I am the only groomer. And I like it that way. I like it that way because Honestly, I just, I wanted something a little less effort and rooming a hundred cats a month is really simple and easy. And my clients are, have to be on a four week schedule. So it's just very different. It's just very different. So with that, you know, picking a business model that makes sense to you is so important. And that is something you do have to do and to pick a business model that makes sense to you. And I'm using the example of the grooming salon because that's, it's generally not mobiles that people get kind of huffy about clients. It's generally salons. Mobile clients are very different clients. They're paying a lot of money. So they're hoping if you entrust them with a $100,000 van that they can entrust their pet. But with the shop, again, let's look at this person walking in and the stranger wants to touch their dog. And they're, maybe the dog's scared. They don't know. They don't know the quality. They don't know any of these things. And it doesn't make, it wouldn't make any sense. So when, when I started this shop, I told everyone why they should trust me. Not why they should trust the business. So I started the Green Paw. Everyone knew why they had to trust the me. Me, the person behind there. So... When I started hiring employees, did I really take the time to explain it? No, because I was busy and I need to make money and like I need the dogs in, I need them out. Like I don't have time for this shit. And that's that as a pet owner, I wouldn't tolerate that. And my clients didn't either. I had a lot of pushback. I had people like, nope, I want you to groom the dog. I want you to groom the dog. I want you to groom the dog. And finally I said, all right, something's got to give. So with that, again, I started having myself up front. And I started with me up front because I was the trusted face. Everyone knew me and they knew they could trust me. And I would tell them, I would tell them like, you know, any dog that comes to my door is going to be groomed by my staff, myself and my staff. And I oversee everything. I double check everyone's work. I double check everything. I am, I'm going to make sure that your pet is safe. And so again, they still, they weaned themselves slowly from my groom to knowing I was overwatching everything and they knew they could trust me. So that's how I weaned my customers personally. And then from there, I got so busy that I had to hire someone up front. And so when I hired an actual receptionist, I hired somebody that I spent a lot of time teaching them 
They knew how to clip nails. They knew how to pluck ears. They knew how to bathe and blow dry a dog properly. They knew how to evaluate a haircut. They knew what matting was. And I spent a lot of time with them up front together, probably about 60 to 90 days, teaching them all of these things. That way, when now, first of all, all these clients are seeing this person up front with me for at my, you know, ideally these clients are every four weeks. So at least twice with me, right? Hi, you know, this is Sam, blah, 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 blah. You know, she's going to be our receptionist when she's ready. You know, I'm making sure she's trained fully. And if you have any questions or comments or concerns about Sam, you know, you guys have my email. And they could, they could always email me. And I did have one customer that didn't, they just personality clashed. And I was like, you know, I'm really sorry to hear that. And I'm more than happy to check in Scooter because, you know, the Scooter's owner just said that she didn't like how happy she was, which whatever, everyone's different. So she was like, she's just too happy. I'm like, I get that. That's fine. So that's what I did with mine. So I was up there for at least two, if not three months, making sure she did everything right. Was I always up front? No, but it was always up front when the client would come in. You know, and I had her call them for the pickup and I did all these other little things and they built trust in her. And more often than not, we're so busy grooming other dogs that we're not building that rapport. And so in this business model that I had when I had my shop, I was the floater. So I would double check every dog as I was coming in, you know, not checking them in, checking them in. But when they would come in and I would say, what did you say? What are the notes? And then I would look at the dog and I'd be like, okay, that's perfect. You know, and when they're done, I would check that. And so there were multiple ways that we checked everything. And so my customers were very comfortable eventually, even with me not being there and being able to have that staff run that business by themselves. And that's really when the magic happens. But a lot of that had to come from me acknowledging the fact that I kind of hurt my business by having people attached to me instead of my business. And I do think that is the fundamental reason why your customers aren't allowing your employees to groom the dogs. You know, have they seen this groomer before? Is this groomer going to stick around? You know, does this groomer have the same skill level as you? And you could hire someone and say they have, they're perfect, they're amazing, da 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 da. But if they're gone in 60 days, you're going to look bad. So when you start handing other dogs to an employee that's a pet groomer, I want you to really think about all these things and have a little compassion for the pet owner. You know, it's really difficult to just hand your pet over to somebody. And especially with all of the things we are learning, I don't want to say like we're learning. Um, I'm always horrified by Facebook because I'm always finding these, I mean, Facebook just sends these terrible articles to me of pets being abused at grooming salons. Um, there was a video of these people like beating on this dog and I'm like, this is horrific. And the worst part is, is that we don't know if these people have actually harmed this pet or if it's just perceived, if the, if the owner doesn't know. We don't know. We just, we don't know. Is it, was it over something simple, like a quick nail? I, I, we were, I was with a, a couple of the New Jersey groomers. It was amazing. We went to the legislation when they were trying to pass licensing for New Jersey pet groomers. And a woman literally told the judge that her veterinarian told her that her Frenchie could bleed to death from a nail, a quick nail, not because he ha has health issues, but that is the way quick to nails work. Like you could quick a nail and the dog could bleed to death. Customers don't always know anything. Like we were all like, what? No way. She's like, that's why I take him to the vet to get his nails clipped. Because if he's there, they can quickly send him to surgery. And we're like, what are you talking about? It's like a paper cut, but she, she just... You know, whatever. I mean, his vets are very fantastic salesmen. Or this lady's nuts, which could be either, I guess. But with that, again, I want you guys to think about that. I know it's a lot to think about. Um, and this video is getting a little long. I don't want to go too crazy. Um, I would love if you guys have any more questions or comments about the situation. 
you know, this is this is why they don't want to give their dog to this person. And you really can't blame them. I know you want to blame them, but when you really think about it and you really dig into the meat of this conversation, you have to acknowledge that you probably have some awesome customers. You know, you probably have some awesome customers and they don't want to just hand their dog over to some rando. That's kind of good, isn't it? That's why they don't go to these other crappy places. Megan is saying, I keep going through groomers trainings for them to learn. And I'm the only groomer currently. And people always assume I'm going to be the groomer. So a corporate two month training winds up being four to six. Well, you know, with groomer trainees, and it starts to get overwhelmed for me to be slammed. Well, first, Megan, let's let's have a let's have a real, real situation here. Don't let them overbook you. Tell them to cut the shit. Tell them that you will burn out and they will pay for mental anguish and mental health for you to be home. If you are corporate, they will tell them, no, no, I can book this many dogs and no more. No more. Not a single one. If you keep overbooking me, I will lose my mind and I will leave. You need to tell them. You need to tell them just like that. Like if you keep and I want it in an email, email them. If you keep overbooking me, either I will have to turn away customers or I will become mentally and physically fatigued and potentially harmed. And I don't want that. Corporate does not want to pay for you to be at home eating bonbons because you are over because you because you burnt out. And legally, if you get injured at corporate, they have to pay for that and don't rush back to work. So if you're an employee or you are, I mean, especially if you are corporate, don't let them bully you. Don't let them bully you. And if you are training someone, Megan, you can't groom a full day's worth of dogs. And it, Megan, are you the grooming salon manager there or are you just a regular groomer? Um, if you could let me know that that makes a big difference, especially in corporate. Um, Megan, let me know if you are the grooming salon manager or if you are just a regular groomer. That would be really helpful for me to know. Um, but with that, you know, you, you should be just very flat out honest with them. Like I'm checking you in, you know, Sarah is going to be your groomer. You know, Sarah is going to be doing this, this, and this, not me. We don't have a salon manager. My, my, my manager basically, I quote, you're basically the grooming manager without the title. Megan, then say, no, that's not how that works. No, you're not going to make me do a job that I'm not being paid for. Do you want to be a grooming salon manager? I wouldn't. There's no money in it. There's there's 10 times more work for none of that. No, no, I'm not going to train people. No, that's not my job. No, they can't tell you have to train someone when it's not your job. No, I do not want to be a grooming salon manager. No. Do you hear how absurd that is? Think about it this way. I want you to think about you're in a different environment. You're working in a different, you saying the store manager is barely involved. Good. Email them. Say, hey, I've been, email them and CC, I'm sorry, email your district manager, CC your store manager, and explain the situation. Hi, I'm being overworked, underpaid. I'm not being paid as a salon manager. I've been doing this work. I'm not comfortable. I have not been trained in how to be a salon manager. I haven't been trained in that. And I just don't feel comfortable. Megan, you're being taken advantage of. And that's why you want to leave. You want to leave because the protections that corporate gives you, you are not creating a healthy boundary and telling them no. You have to do that. And you know, actually, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to not burn out, not get injured, and not get fucked you have to do that because your store manager is taking advantage of you. And that's not cool. It's not cool. So, you know, if I worked, um, you know, I have a good friend who works for IBM up in Boston. They, they do a lot of uh, computer crap. He can't do a job that he's not qualified for or in the position of. Yeah. Yeah, Megan, they're, 
they don't know what they're talking about. Megan's saying, my store manager came from managing a hot topic, so she's just a hot mess. Yeah, so contact your district manager. Right, they don't understand. They don't understand. So, you, but you need to contact your district manager and you need to say no. Because you can't be treated. They don't understand. Unless if you have worked a hard day's groom, I don't care if you've even just been a bather. Like, if she had been a bather, like, the day before Thanksgiving, then I'd be like, look, okay, she doesn't understand. But no, these people are the people that book, like, five doodles in one day. And they're like, what's the big deal? And you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. You just have you – have, I know it's going to be really – this is actually a great learning opportunity for you, Megan, and anyone listening. Learning to say no. No, this is not my job. No. I'm not going to do this and doing it in writing because then if they overbook you or make you the, like you can't train people, that's not your job. And if they want to give you the grooming salon manager position, I would say no, because you don't make enough money and you have way more liability. Things like this are why pets die in corporate salons because the grooming salon manager cannot groom a full day's worth of dogs and watch people who've never touched an animal. You can't do it. And people that say you can, you can do it for a little bit until somebody does something real stupid. You know, Megan, right now, if your trainees put soap in a dog's eye and they burn out the cornea, that's the end of your career. You think for a second they're not going to throw you under the bus? You think for a second they're not going to say, oh, well, Megan, Megan wasn't watching them. Megan didn't treat them, train them well. Megan's saying, I don't want that they don't pay nearly enough. They don't even charge enough for grooms. They wear cheaper than PetSmart. Honestly, all the money in Petco PetSmart is all in the add-ons. I made, I made damn good money when I worked at uh, Petco because every dog had whatever the hell that package was. I would quote people on the package. I would never quote them on the base groom. Um, I The way I would quote it, is I quoted it with the the pick three or whatever the package was. And I told them unless they wanted a five strip, it, it was a scissor skew. So I was doing like $75 Yorkies. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. And if they were aggressive, I got to send them home. I'm like, oh, Fluffy's crazy. Oh, I work corporate. We're not allowed to muzzle. Bye-bye. That's the truth. And it was great. But you, but you have to, you have to, you know, yeah, we have the spa package and I quote the price to get the money. Always include, yeah, exactly. You always include D-Shot. I always include D-Shot. You can add in hours, but you have to, when you're, when you're working corporate, this is the way you kind of get around that stuff is you get to say, okay, look, um, I'm going to sound like a rotten human being right now. You need to use that employee handbook that they will throw at you anytime something wrong happens. It's out of your control and say, no, that's not my job. Nope. Sorry. Nope. Mm -mm. Um, no, 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 nope. Nope. So I personally, and you do what you want because it's your job and your life and all of that. Megan, you would be so much happier. Other people that are listening, if there's the reason employees are not happy is because you haven't learned how to say no. How can you run a business if you can't say no to somebody who works a hot topic? Never mind a customer. I mean, think about that. You can't say to someone who works from hot topic to Petco, PetSmart, they don't know what your job is. You have to say no. No, this is not my job. It's not my job to train people. Go send them to another store. Oh, you're not near any store. Oh, well, that really sucks. I guess you're going to be playing for a plane ticket. Or you guys are going to have to hire someone from another store to come in for a couple of months to train those people. That's not your job. And you can't do it because, you know, in, uh, so I live in Rhode Island. Um, for the guys that are here, it's in the U.S. And, you know, I did not work for Petco when the second pet died, but I did work for Petco when the first pet died. It was not in my store, but it was in my state. And there was a pug that 
died. They, they told everyone the dog died because it had a breathing issue. No, someone manhandled that dog and the dog died. And then they had a cat that died uh, due to hyperthermia because they put the cat wet in a cage dryer. And I remember when I worked for Petco at the time when the pug died. And pretty much what happened is that we were being told to do things that were against code. And I'm a bitch. So I said no. And so everyone hated me. But when that dog died, guess what everyone was doing? What they were supposed to do up to code. And all the other groomers from the other store, guess what? They came to my store to learn the right way, even though they were doing exactly what my store was doing. Things like in my store, you had to have the groomer's helper on at all times. Were they doing that? No. You know, we're, you know, things like we had every dog had to do a team lift. Why? Because if a dog jumps on a table and rips an ACL, guess who's liable for that? You know, and it was any dog at my shop, it was over 30 pounds at the Petco I worked at. And so they would book me like a lab bath and I'd be like, hey guys, guess what? I can't lift a lab on the table by myself. So pfft, can't work by myself and do a lab, can I? And I, and they hated that I stuck to the letter of the law. But let me tell you, if something had happened, I followed their policies to a T. Policies like that are created to protect you, to make you a happy employee. Embrace them, enjoy them, appreciate them. Don't let them abuse you. Don't let assholes who have worked at Hot Topic and decided it would be fun to work with puppies and kitties take over your job. We are the professionals. We know what we're doing. And there are plenty of Petco managers and pet smart man managers that have a lot of pet experience, but a lot of them don't. And those are the worst. And so with that, I want you, Megan, if you don't mind, please, 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 please learn how to say no. Don't let them abuse you. And I know you feel really pressured by this person, but you, if, if only for yourself and your career, you do not, do not want a social media firestorm. There are so many people whose careers are destroyed because let's say if your trainee is manhandling a dog and it's videotaped and you're the man, you're not the manager, but you are the manager and you're the one who trained that person, they're going to throw you under the bus. Because it's not going to be just you. It's going to be, you know, that whole staff. And you just, I mean, I don't know about you, but like the last thing I want is to be, you know, I love what I do and I don't want to lose it that way. Uh, Megan is saying, no, I've worked so hard to get where I am and I'm not accepting this bullshit. And you don't. I, if and, and that's anybody here, if you are working somewhere and it's not about being entitled, you don't have to be a bitch about it. I'm a little bit of a bitch. I can be. I'm in New England, though. We're all kind of assholes. But, you know, um, I, I, I hope someone here is from the South. They're always much nicer. It's like, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. Mm -mm. No. You know, don't let people bully you. Um, if you're a regular employees and you're grooming a dog that you know is unhealthy, you know is dangerous, say no. Do not wait until that dog dies on your table because it is the crypt keeper. And you can tell, you can just tell when that dog is like going to die. Like you're like, that dog is going to die in the next like couple of days. You know, it's like, I always... I love, I love grooming old doggies. Like I love, like that is my heart is like elderly. Like I love like all the old Goldens, the old Aussies. They're like little, you know, or like the old Bichons that are like the crib keepers. They have like no teeth and they're like, and you're like, dude, like they're like no teeth. I know that's my thing. But like, you know, when that dog is going to croak. So, you know, if you're in a shop, do you want to be that groomer? That's hard. You know, in your corporate, you really can't be that groomer because you will be all over the papers, whether or not you did anything wrong. That's the truth. You know, and corporate, the beautiful, the, the reason that being an employee is fun. I had so much fun working for Petco. Now, I had to leave my Petco because 
I knew that district manager at the time was not following through with the issues that there was. Um, and obviously they didn't. Two pets died within a couple of months of each other in Rhode Island. And they did massive changes afterwards. But I was like, I can't be here if you guys are going to like kill pets because they're not following. They weren't following the employee handbooks. They weren't following policy, but that's because the managers were more focused on the money, you know, and the people that had been running the salon before on it. And I wasn't salon manager because fuck that shit, you know, but the people who had been running that shop beforehand, they were, um, not, I mean, you want to talk about not following policy. I mean, it was, it was atrocious. It was atrocious. We'll just leave it like that. But if you're an employee and you have a place with employee handbook and there's policies, follow the policies. And if your employer tells you to not follow the policies, say, I will need that in writing, please. And you have the right to say no. You have absolutely every right to say no. Every right to say no. If your employees, employer is saying to you, I'm sorry, your employer is saying to you, to your a grooming salon manager, but not in title. On what planet is that any of, that's like the worst of both worlds. You have all the responsibility, none of the benefits, and <laughs> none of that's good. I would just say, I'm real sorry, but no, absolutely not. And if they say, why? I say, that's not my job title. And if they say, oh, well, you're going to be the grooming salon manager. Be like, actually, I do not. I'm not interested in that job title. And if they overbook you, be very clear in writing what a safe amount of dogs to groom is. And don't just say five dogs. I would say, you know, it's either five dogs in reasonable condition under 25 pounds or one large dog. I can only groom one large dog a day. You can do that a hundred different ways. Um, I actually trained because I, I'm, I'm, I'm all about systems. That's how I love running everything. I like building a better mousetrap. So at my um, Petco, I had a little piece of paper and I told everyone how I would do that. And it was all based upon um, points. And that's how I did it. Like a 10 strip Shih Tzu every four weeks, which you think doesn't happen, but oh boy, they do. And they're awesome. That's one point. Or uh, a short hair Chihuahua bath. That's not an asshole. That's one point. You know, two points would be like a lab bath. Um, again, there's not many haircuts that would be two points, you know, three points would be, you know, maybe a two point would be like a five strip, not matted things like that. And it went up to so many points and I could do so many points in one day and that's how I did it. And that's how they knew how to book me. And I like to be booked very specifically. I like to be booked a haircut on the hour. I should say two haircuts in the hour, two baths on the half, and then an hour free so that I had time to catch up on everybody. And I would do that twice. Sometimes three times, you know, so I built my way. I like to be scheduled and you can do that in corporate. There's so many fun things you can do with corporate. Corporate offers a lot of opportunity. Managers just suck. But what's nice is that those managers generally get fired eventually or they leave your grooming salon alone. But no, Megan, if that, if that, if that salon, if that store manager is telling you your job is to get product as far as like order product, I would say, no, that's not my job. No, that's not my job. And every time you run out of product, that sucks. However, I would then again, email district and that. Why? Because what's eventually going to happen is for those of you guys who've never worked corporate, in corporate, there is a, another manager that does fucking nothing they're supposed to be for the grooming salons. They're supposed to be going around quarterly to all the grooming salons in their district, which they don't. Dog trainers, grooming salons, they don't. However, if you barrage them with emails, they will pay attention. As your district manager is going to say to that manager, the uh, service manager, they're going to say, hey, service manager, when was the last time you've been to that store? Oh, like last month. They're like, really? Because they haven't had shampoo in two weeks. Oh. Well, that's the store manager's problem. And store manager's going to be like, no, it's the grooming salon manager. And they're going to be like, where's the grooming salon manager? We don't have a grooming salon manager. Oh, well, then guess what, store manager? Now it's your job. Or hire somebody. And that, but they don't have to. When you don't say no, they don't have to hire somebody. 
I don't know if you know this, but for the most part, unless if this has changed, the grooming salon manager gets bonuses. If there is no grooming salon manager, where do you think those bonuses go? To the store manager. So there's no incentive for them to do anything because you're willing to do the job for free. So don't do it. Just say no. And you have to be uh, angry about it. Just say no. Why not? It's not my job. Well, it, it's kind of your job. No. Nope. Here's my job description. Nope, not my job. My job is to book myself dogs. Um, when I'm in the shop, keep the shop clean. You have two other employees, you have trainees, and you're not going to keep trainees because I don't have time to train them because you need somebody to train them. And you can't, you can't make enough money training other people if you're not a grooming salon manager. And even then you really can't make enough money. That's why no one wants to do it. So just focus on doing your dogs checking in your dogs. No, I'm not going to train these people. Nope, that's not my job. I don't have time. My time is cleaning up after myself, grooming my dogs, and calling people to come in to groom dogs. No, I'm not going to work overtime. Nope, you know, there's no way to me to do, you know, for me, I can't do eight dogs in eight hours. I can't do that. Oh, stay late. Oh, so you're going to pay me overtime? Oh, you want me to punch out for overtime? Oh, I'm not doing that. Or no, I'm not working overtime. I make commission. Nope, not working overtime. I work commission. Therefore, if I work overtime, I'm not actually making any extra money. Nope. Mm -mm. So Megan, I hope that's helpful. I know I kind of went off on a tangent about that, but I'm really passionate about that. I really get angry when employers, see, here's the thing. Being an employee is amazing once you learn how to say no. And I get so mad when employers take advantage of employees because that's not fair. And that is why the grooming industry has this really nasty aversion to being an employer. I'm sorry, to being an employee. And that's why they have a lot of employees who are like, feisty and angry and rude and entitled because they've been so fucked over by other assholes that they're like, I just want this. Megan's saying you were extremely helpful. I need someone who understands the position to tell me how it is. Look, I've been in this industry a long time. Um, you guys are always welcome here every Monday at 7 p.m. And this is the live. So what we do is we cut this down and then we get a shorter version that you guys can watch. Um, I post those on Fridays. You know, Megan, you are always welcome here. You're welcome in my group. Um, What's really nice about this is I have worked just about every position in the grooming industry. The only one I have not done is I have not groomed at a veterinarian office. Um, but I have a very good friend who groomed at a vet office for a very long time, actually multiple vet offices. So I talk to her sometimes when I need perspective on that. It is really difficult. This is a very different industry. When I go to these conferences outside of our industry, I love it because Things that are commonplace in here are criminal in other industries. And we learn, I learned so much from there. But what's nice is I bring that knowledge back here for you. And I've been doing this long enough. I know like I'm look like I'm 12. I'm not. I've been doing this long enough that I can tell you guys what does work, what doesn't work. And you know, I'm always learning more things every day. And so when people say like this worked for me and this is how I get to listen. But with corporate, corporate is so fun when you do it right, Megan. You're going to have so much fun. You're going to make so much money. Once you learn to tell these people to go fuck themselves, <laughs> you're going to have fun clients because people like that are super low maintenance because people that come to Petco just want their dog clean and short. And if they want anything fancy, just throw three scissor skews on there. If they want a Continental or if they want a lamb cut, don't just keep adding scissor skews. They'll go elsewhere. They'll go elsewhere. Unless you like that. I don't like that. I don't like scissoring poodles. That is like my nightmare. And I have a poodle. That's why someone else grooms her because I don't want to do that. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's so fun. It is fun because Petco has these great benefits and you get to enjoy them and you get to build your resume and, you know, enjoy that. Don't let them bully you. Don't let them bully you. Don't let them do that. Um, that actually might be a really great um, video too about how to make corporate fun. Because I, I did. I worked for Pet Supplies Plus, which I really loved because they 
um, you know, with Pet Supplies Plus, I was able to bring in my stuff. Like they let me bring my Prima. They had a little less information for me. But, you know, but there wasn't as much, there was more money in the sense that I made more money, but they had way less benefits. You know, I would have stayed at Petco forever if the Petco in my area made wiser decisions, but they didn't. And I'm very glad I left when I did leave because I saw the writing on the wall. Um, Megan is saying that is who I work for and I love them. We just had to swap managers. So it's kind of not our, yeah, Pet Supplies Plus is kind of a hot mess. Uh, Pet Supplies Plus. Um, yeah, it's because uh, I forget his name, but the the guy. So Pet Supplies Plus, when I worked there, I worked there. I don't even know how long, but when I worked there, I worked there as a second job. That was really fun because I just kind of wanted. I don't know, because I'm a sick, twisted workaholic. <laughs> um, so I worked there part time and I loved it. And one thing I did notice was that the their regional pet manager, I don't know if it's still, his name was Noah, and I never met him. He was supposed to come to my store to uh, make sure I passed this like safety thing. And my manager like just forged his signature. It was terrible. Yeah, it was, it was no, no bueno. And Pet Supplies Plus has been growing like crazy. There's one in South County in my area and it's a terrible place to have a grooming salon. It is a tourist town. No one lives there all year round and they can't keep a groomer because they get the flood in the summer of all the tourists and they're, you know, all crazy. And then they leave and then that groomer has no money and they can't figure out why they can't help, hey, keep a groomer. I mean, well, it makes sense to me. Like who wants, who wants that position? Who wants, you know, angry, frustrated, you know, why can't you groom like my last groomer? Um, she's wearing our region and I haven't seen him in like five months. It's only groomer since our two years and people just won't stay. Well, I mean, no. Um, you know, I mean, again, but people don't stay at grooming salons, even regular grooming salons. Because why would they stay? What's the benefit to staying? I want you to really think about that. Why would someone stay at a salon when stagnant? There's no growth. Like Pet Supplies Plus, there's no growth. There's nothing better you can do. There's no growth. You get to be a groomer and groom dogs in and out every day until you die. And it's just miserable. So like people move shops because at least then they get a change of scenery. Um, so AT2 Productions, I don't know, I don't know who you are, what you are, but that's fine. Uh, they're writing, there is where I love the axiom. If you don't value yourself, how can you expect anyone else to? I agree. I mean, I do think, I think we all as groomers should definitely value ourselves. I think that we should value what we do. I do think some groomers are a little, um, you know, we, we kind of act like we're gods. I think that's kind of weird. Like I, I work hard. I do. My cat grooming is on point. Getting the certified feeling master groomer, big thing. But um, so that was nice. But, you know, dog grooming, like I am, I'm, it sounds awful. I'm like, as a dog groomer, I'm pretty solidly mediocre and I'm pretty okay with that. I can make a good groom. The groom's really nice. And I have zero interest in breed standard cuts. I have zero interest in competition. And it's kind of weird in the grooming industry because everyone I talk to that is an influencer or they're an industry leader love all these things. And I hate them. I think that's miserable. But I love cat grooming. So even someone who's a mediocre dog groomer can become an amazing cat groomer. So you just have to figure out what you're good at. And I'm really good at the business side. And I'm really good at finding niches and solving people's problems. And I really love doing that. Um, Megan is saying, at least at Pet Supplies Plus is where I met my fiance. So something good. Let's, Megan, so anybody here listening, please understand. Whenever you are at, again, I'm granola crunchy. Let's begin with that. So, because I have to say that. So I really believe that Life is a delicious journey. 
So where you are right now is where you're meant to be. For how long? It depends. You have to learn something wherever you are. So, you know, I've worked in a lot of places. And a lot of that is because once I, I have a very good sense, I will say, at knowing when at knowing when it's time to move on. I have learned what I have learned, and now it's time to move on. So, you know, when I managed the doggy daycare, you know, there wasn't anything ever I was going to learn more there. So then I left, you know, when I worked, you know, even at Petco PetSmart and Pet Supplies Plus, I really enjoyed working there, but I learned what I liked about their places. I liked what I, I learned what I didn't like. You know, I learned some great stuff from them that I still use nowadays. So, you know, that was really important. But, you know, for me, I knew my growth was bringing me to a different place. And it's great that you met someone you loved. And maybe that's the whole point. The universe put you there. The universe, God, whatever, you know, brought you there. Or maybe it was to really learn how to groom well and get comfortable in a place that you have benefits. Because Pet Supplies Watch has decent benefits. They're not as good as Petco. At least they used to not be. Um, but they're they're really great. Their 401k is fantastic. It actually has a decent match. You have health insurance. You can do all of these things and continue to grow. Um, and with that, you know, you can set yourself up and start again saving and doing all these things for the next five years. And then when you're ready to leave, you can do that. The groomer that grooms my standard poodle now, she's an amazing groomer. She gets, you know, best of Rhode Island all the time. She's she does competitions. And she was a Pet Supplies Plus groomer that she had to leave because with Pet Supplies Plus, I, you know, it's a very, for those of you guys who haven't heard about it, it's a newer franchise. Like they've been exploding and they keep doing these course correction things where they'll be doing really well. And then they're like, uh, actually, we don't want to do this. And what happened with Tiffany pretty much and I don't mean to speak her business. I, I hope she doesn't think it's rude to me. But they got really pushy about what she could and couldn't do with the salon. And they pushed her enough that she went and she opened up her own shop. She probably would have been just as happy being just a groomer and enjoying being an employee. There's a lot of fun to being an employee. But, you know, Megan, you may want to consider eventually, you know, instead of opening up your own shop, working for a, a really awesome grooming salon and maybe that's a competition level groomer um like a jody murphy or uh suzeko or maybe it's just a a shop like i had my shop was all about we were again we were called the green pos plus holistic we did you know make sure everyone's cute and comfortable and happy and well groomed you know and you can find places like that um at2 says was referencing the whole you have to be able to say no. Okay, that makes sense. So ATT was saying, if you don't value yourself, how can you expect to anyone else to when they were talking about saying no? And I do. I think that no, saying no gives you the ability to say yes later. It gives you the ability to say yes to things that make more sense. If you are overworked and underpaid, you cannot say yes to the things that you really, a, a really awesome opportunity. And there's so many, I mean, there's so many options and avenues that could walk in. I mean, you know, and there's so many different business models that if you do definitely know in your heart and soul, you want to open up your own business, you know, you may want to take a mobile grooming job one day a week to see if mobile something you like, or start a very small house call business and see if house call something you want to do, you know, or Take a job one day a week at a competition level groomer who's, you know, eventually once your skill set gets up is going to hire you full time. There's so many things you can do. And there are so many options. And it's such a fun thing. It's so fun. Um, but people really talk about corporate like it's this really negative thing. And it's not. Corporate can be so fun. You just have to say no to people that don't know what they're doing. And they're not doing what corporate's saying. And it's really important, too, to get it in writing. Because when you send it in writing, and I know with Pet Supplies Plus, you know, that's that's super common. Um, at my store, we had a big issue where the store manager pretty much did nothing. They did nothing. And the assistant managers are running around like nut bars 
because the store manager knew that everybody was going to do everything, you know, and that franchise is it's so some of them are corporate stores. Some of them are franchise stores. They're all growing way too fast. Um, and pet supplies plus for those of you guys have never heard of it. Again, this is a branding thing. Um, pet supplies plus the problem with them is their mantra. I forget the name of what their mantra says, but essentially you can bring in anything at any price and they'll price match. It would be crazy. Like people would bring in things like chewy.com and it would be like half and they'd be like, cool. And they would just change the price. You know, when you have, when you're attracting those kind of Walmart customers, those kind of McDonald's customers, it's really a pain in the ass to build a grooming salon when the customer that comes into your, to that grooming salon is probably going to be those Walmart style customers. And the nice thing is that you don't have to worry about that, but don't let them bully you. Don't let them bully you. Say, no, I'm not the grooming salon manager. No, I'm not going to train these people. No, I'm not going to take this, you know. And they don't, it's not that they don't care. It's, you know, it's a company. The company doesn't know they're burning you out. They don't know unless you tell them. And if you tell them and they don't care and something happens to you, they're legally liable. So I'm just going to ask if anyone has any more questions and then we'll wrap this up. It has been awesome to talk to everybody. I really appreciate everything. Um, I know we got a little off topic. What was nice is that we're going to be able to have a new a video all about, uh, you know, the actual topic. And then we're also going to be able to start with, I have maybe I'll make some smaller videos out of this talking about, you know, Megan's questions, which I really appreciated. And AT2, thank you so much for adding in these other points. They really help. And I think that was a really uplifting quote because I do agree. I think that if you don't value you, who will? Right, guys? I mean, that's the truth. And you, you do have to stand up for yourself. If you don't, no one will. No one, there's no employer who, well, I mean, that's not true. There are, there are very good employers. But even in my personal life, there's no one sitting there like, oh, River, have you like eaten today? Have you like, you know, taking good care of yourself? Are you da, 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 da? No, because we just don't, we don't think about it. You know, we're just go, 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 go. Especially if you're in the grooming industry. I mean, you know, I mean, there's days, every groomer, every groomer's had a day where you get home and you don't even shower. You just get in the bed. Um, you know, I remember like the day before Thanksgiving, I'd be so gross. Like, you know, you're like covered in dog hair. It's like in your ears and like you find in your bra and you don't even care. It's like sweated onto there. It's like now it's like a second bra. I would just crawl in bed and be like, I'm just done. And then, Yeah. And that would cater Thanksgiving because who are these crazy people grooming an entire day before Thanksgiving and then cooking a whole meal? Who are these people? I would love to meet them. They're like superheroes. I was lucky if I could open a can the next day. And I would take the whole week off because I was burnt out as crap. So anyway, I digress. Lovely to see you guys as usual. I want to thank you guys so much for being here live with me. If you guys are seeing the replay, I hope you guys enjoyed this as well. My name is River Lee of the Savvy Groomer. If you would like to learn more about me, please go to my website, which is SavvyGroomer.com. Um, please come here and join us for Grow Wealthy Grooming every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time for those of you guys that don't know. I also would encourage you, if you are a pet groomer, to apply to join my Facebook group called Finances for the Grooming Industry. And last but not least, if you guys are interested, we will be posting more for Personal Finance on a Leash, which is my online course talking about how to get your personal finances on a leash if you're in the pet industry. It's a lot of fun. We do it twice a, a year because it is a 12-week course. And as we're going through it, what we do is we have a nice group and I do a Facebook Live anywhere between one and two times a week. And that's really great for momentum and really changing these habits and the more money you have in the bank, the more we work on your personal finances, the easier it is for you to either start your own business, you know, whatever you want to do, it's so much easier once you have your finances under control. And a lot of you guys, it's not that you're broke. Um, one of my students, Paige, I adore her. Um, she owns her own mobile business. In the 12 weeks that we had our course, she saved $14,000. 
because she had just been blowing it. And that's sad to say, but I mean, we've all kind of done that. We've all made a lot of money and then not really paid attention to where it's going. And that's really nice about my course is that we figure out where that money is going and how to behave. A lot of us almost have like a retractable lead on our money. You know, we're just sitting there like, yeah, 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 I got the dog on a leash. It's like, it's like getting around people. We get like the flexi lead burns, you know, and that's what happens with our finances because we're, we're, we have it. We think we have it, but it's really just running amok. So I look forward to seeing you guys next week. I look forward to you guys seeing you in my group and I look forward to seeing you on my blog. All right, guys. So I want to say have a great evening and happy grooming.